Welcome to the Backyard Professor Live Show. I have a couple of really good guests tonight that I'm really excited to have. But in the meantime, before we show their lovely faces, we are going to get this show on the road so we can have a good night of learning. Sorry, I was going to adjust that volume. I blew it again. Everyone's going to yell like crazy at me. Oh, well, it is the Backyard Professor show after all. Okay, you guys, I've got a few news items first, but I am going to bring on my guests because they deserve to see you and you definitely deserve to see them. So let's see our guests, Cheryl Bruno and Dr. Nick Letursky authors of the book Method Infinite. How are you two doing tonight? Very good. Wonderful, thanks. Good, wonderful. Uh, I have heard some interesting news I'll share with you guys and with the audience. Uh, this last week, India has done something extremely interesting. <laughs> they have produced a 15-foot tall statue of Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, in their, I think it's called the Hall of Peace, something like that. But wow, what, a, what an interesting situation on that. They've been going crazy on the message boards about this thing. And I asked Joseph in a dream that I had, I said, uh, so what do you think of the uh, statue? And this was his reaction. He got a pretty big smile out of it. So he was quite happy about that. So anyway, okay, that's enough goofing off, except for one more thing. I wonder if they'll let us use that to make um, casts to put on top of our temples. <laughs> right? There you go. <laughs> Good point, Cheryl. Yeah. My initial thought was that it's, that's not exactly what Moroni told him his name would be uh, used as. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> a good argument right <laughs> well this is the first time i've had two guests on at once so you two get a fight out for the uh, attention and talk but we will get to this subject we will start with uh, your information on dan vogel and your response to several of dan vogel's ideas cheryl has produced some lovely slides that we've got however i was given a meme that i'm going to share I'm not sure if Jeff Bradshaw is here tonight. If he is, welcome, Jeff. This is, we're having fun a little bit at your expense, but it's not my meme, but this was produced. So I wanted to share that with you. I've been talking with Jeff and uh, he, he recognizes that uh, you guys have kind of been working in cahoots in the background somewhat with the book and book reviews and all. So anyway, um, I might have him on the show. I'm going to, I'm going to get with him over the Christmas holiday and he's expressed an interest in potentially at least doing a show or a podcast. So everyone just, deserves their chance. What's that? Everyone deserves their five cents. Yeah. Yeah. For that's best, what I best, love. About. For best results offer him lunch. Lunch is very important to Jeff. Yes, he has had me out to lunch a few times. Bless his heart. It is. Hey, it's I have had lunch with Jeff Bradshaw myself. <laughs> All right, you guys. So you uh, you wrote this book, and I didn't make a thumbnail of it. Method Infinite. And I've this got. Very, I did notice that your thumbnail of me in your advertisement 
was a was a sexy pose from back in 2000 and back in 2008 i think it was is that oh um, wow well, yes it, i think it's your facebook page <laughs> and that was the best picture i could find of you because oh, well thank you I very much so, I, I do look pretty so. good in it but I, i'm not not so scholarly you know not I so tried scholarly. to get the background out of the one where you're in the forest and it kept taking out all your hair on the side of your head oh, okay and so i i took out we don't want that we don't want that we, okay we I, I i love that he slimmed me down considerably if you notice i'm i'm propped <laughs> very flattering <laughs> nice v yeah. though. yeah <laughs> Well, it looks like we're all here. I'm going to say hello to everybody. Trevor, Luke, my good friend, Tom Miller. Hello. Love all you guys. Let's see who else is hanging out. Lamb Chop, Savannah Thompson, Mark Crispin. Yeah, baby. I've got to do that for Mark. Somehow we've jived and I always do. Radio Free Mormon. Good to see you, my friend. L Newton Lemnos from Brazil, Can Barry Richens, thank you. Tim Rathbone, always good to see you. He's been a good guest. Dan Vogel, the man is in the house. He's been a good guest. And Radio Free Mormon has been a good guest. Peter Higgs, how are you? Abby Hayes, good to see you. Let's see, who else have we got real quick? It looks like you guys are holding the show. Jason Smith. Good to see you. And then Mormon discuss. Oh, wait, that was me. Okay, so I said hi to all you wonderful people. Let's get this road on the show. Yeah, baby. Good job, Mark. I'm telling you. Uh, we're going to make a T-shirt just for him. Um, so uh, how would you two like to start? It's your show. It's your information. Well, um, Kit, let's put up our first slide, and we'll just jump right in. And what I'd like to do first is just um, tell you that um, I've taken notes on the past. How many times did you have Dan on? Four, was it? Let's see. I think I've, yeah, I think Dan was on four. And we're going to do another one in uh, January where we will discuss the, uh, I believe, the Book of Mormon. Dan, if I'm wrong with that, correct me in the comments. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the, the Book of Mormon chapter in your book also. Okay. Well, so then Dan, that'll be easier uh, to Come on. You know, I, I would just like to mention, you know, before we really jump in, I, you know, even though we clearly are going to disagree with Dan in some respects, I've always really admired his work. I mean, you know, years ago, I completely got rid of my Mormon library. And as the few books that I have reconvened uh, that have been really specific to my interests have turned out to be, you know, a small collection and about a third of it are Dan Bogle's works. Yeah, that's well, it. I have a tremendous remember. respect for his work. We happen to have some disagreements uh, over the last four weeks. That's all that's, good. I've and I wanted to say, I also wanted to say that I'm very flattered that Dan um, chose to review our book um, in this way um, because he does not often review other books. And so I feel that, you know, he took the book seriously enough to respond to it. And I uh, was very, very pleased that he did so. And so um, that's, yeah, that's thank wonderful. You for, thank you for that. I, I was thrilled. I'm thrilled that him and I have become good friends like all of us. And uh, he was willing to come on my show. I've always admired his work as well. So now that we buttered him up, <laughs> because we know he's here, let's kick his butt. Oh. <laughs> I'm kidding, Dan. Calm down. <laughs> okay yeah he, well, so, he, he here's what he says i don't review books right uh, right right he does not entry that he spent so much time on on your book thank you for that that's good yes good, i feel good. very flattered and um yeah. glad that he took it seriously and um um that i was very um i i his points were very well taken um there are i will talk about the things that I feel like he really had some good points for improvement. Um, and yeah. then of course, others that we disagree with. 
So. Yeah, it's all good. I don't agree with any one single author I've ever read. And that's what makes this show so fun is giving everyone their voices. So let's, uh, let's look at this first slide here. Let's okay. So, um, so Dan talks a lot about um, that. Um, one critique of our book is that he says that we have developed a meta narrative around Joseph Smith and masonry that makes it all make sense. A meta, a meta narrative is an overarching account or interpretation of events and circumstances that provides a pattern or structure for people's beliefs and gives meaning to their experiences. So he says that's what humans do. They like to have things make sense. And so they, they put the structure up um, to form this meta narrative. And that's what he feels that we've done in Method Infinite. Um, but this is a point that I am going to take issue with because Nick and I, and also Joe as well, um, are trained in the scholarly method and we are not apologists, which if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll show you what an apologist is because, um, because Dan also then compares people who, who make these meta narratives to apologists. And apologetics is the religious discipline of defending doctrines through systematic argumentation and discourse, reasoned arguments or writings in justification of a theory or religious doctrine. So they are starting, apologetics is where you start with what you believe and then you prove it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is not what we have done in this book. Um, where we started with kind of an open mind, not knowing where this would go. And through the evidence, we came to some of our conclusions. And that is what a historian does. And Dan has done this in his books as well. I, I was going to say, I want to show you an example of a meta narrative that has been created uh, through the course of an interpretation of the research. And here's like that, that title. Yes. Uh, and this yeah. book ends with the declaration yeah. of a pious fraud. Uh, that in itself is a meta narrative that develops out of the collective evidence. And that, that interpretive tool is both natural and useful. It would not be useful to just vomit evidence without coming up with a interpretation mm -hmm. and an understanding of where that evidence leads. I think and one thing I think one thing I liked uh, about the book, what what this book showed me is, and and through the years I've kind of gained a, a better understanding through, of course, conversations with Joe and you, Cheryl, and you, Nick, and others, the incredible inclusion throughout the whole course of the late 1700s, all the way up through the Morgan affair and beyond, the inclusion in the culture of Freemasonry. I thought that's, that's what your book did so very well. And so you're saying that's not a meta narrative. You have discovered how deep the influence is. Well, I'm not saying that it's not necessarily a meta narrative. I don't think um, we need to look at a meta narrative as being a bad thing. You know, like Nick said, the um, um, Dan Dan's book um, also provides a meta narrative. Um, so meta narrative, he doesn't have to use that as like such a a bad a bad thing. And compared to apologetics, which it is not. Um, so um, the, the, the irony here is when I first began the research, I was a um, somewhat vigorously. <laughs> believing Latter-day Saint. And if, if there was any starting, you know, predetermined meta narrative, it was my naive guess at the beginning that Freemasonry was somehow a prophecy of Joseph Smith, which of course you know, the evidence you know, made it clear that was not it. And that was a very naive starting place, but we followed the evidence rather than starting with an interpretation. Right. Right. So, um, so one of the things that uh, Dan has said in his, um, he has talked before quite a bit about Freemasonry and the Book of Mormon. 
and he feels that the Book of Mormon is anti-Masonic. And in our book, we take issue with that and say that um, there are two um, views of, okay, here's, here is some of the newspapers of the day talking about the Book of Mormon being anti-Masonic. And I think this is where Dan picks this up and other um, historians pick this up. We have um, Beadle saying, Smith's new translation of the Old Testament is full of anti-Masonry. And then we have William Perkins, Billy Perkins says, the Mormon Bible is anti-Masonic. So, um, and then of course they quote Martin Harris saying, the Book of Mormon is the anti-Masonic Bible. But what Dan doesn't tell you is, if we go to the next slide, um, we also have um, newspaper articles of the day saying that the Book of Mormon is Masonic. And this is Eber D. Howe uh, responding to Billy Perkins saying, you appear not to be aware that some zealous Masons and several Republican Jacks have beset Joe Smith for more light. And, and that's a Masonic phrase there, more light. And perhaps you have yet to learn that the Mormon Bible was printed and sent forth to the world from a Masonic printing office under a Masonic or some, some other injunction of secrecy. You may also discover a very striking resemblance between Masonry and Mormonism. So um, there are there is disagreement um, among the people of the day whether the Book of Mormon is Masonic or anti-Masonic. And um, so what we do is we show um, that there are different ways of looking at Masonry that we feel that Joseph Smith took from um, uh, some of the Masonic writings of the day where you have pure Masonry and spurious Masonry. So you have a Masonry that has come down from the beginning and is um, is true masonry, and then you have an apostate form of it. And so the Book of Mormon shows both of these. They show the they do show the apostate forms of masonry, and then they also show like Nephi building a temple after the manner of Solomon. They show smiths. Um, they show the brother of Jared. They show all kinds of um, figures that can be said to be. Masonic in this true or pure way. So the Book of Mormon shows um, Joseph's vision of how Masonry can be either a good thing or it can be apostate, right? And now I was really interested when the book came out, I was really interested to see what Dan Vogel would say about this because, um, you know, he is known for saying the Book of Mormon is anti-Masonic. So I, I was hoping that he would address this. Um, but I felt like on your show, he did not dig into um, this point very strongly. I felt he just said, oh, they're making a meta narrative and dismissed that, um, you know, that point. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't feel like he necessarily um, dug into it and took it seriously. So he says down here, the spurious Masons were not really Masons, but heathen mystery cults. Okay, let's, so let's address that. So Dan said in your, um, in your podcast that um, George Oliver, who was the Masonic writer of the time, um, did not mean that spurious Masons were um, apostate 19th century Masons, right? And that's true. We agree with that. We agree that George Oliver did not mean that. However, Joseph Smith was interpreting George Oliver this way. So Dan doesn't understand that. We're not saying George Oliver ever, you know, felt that, um, you know, the Illinois Lodge was spurious masonry. However, Joseph Smith is the one that interpreted Oliver's words to, um, to mean this. So... Um, do you have anything further to say, Nick? I, I feel like well, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> it's okay. It's all good. Of course, you know, keep in mind that, that George Oliver also goes back to the creation and identifies all of the biblical patriarchs as, as grand masters of masonry and specifically mm -hmm. talks about the apostasy of Cain mm -hmm. and, and goes into this idea of a spurious Freemasonry. So 
while Dan is correct uh, with regard to much of the later narrative and, and the later time frame, it has its origins in, in the framing that George Oliver gives, right? You know, directly from Cain. And again, you know, you have to look at George Oliver as a solid source on. Yeah, I'll, exactly. George Oliver is key figure here, Trevor. Yeah. You have to look at George Oliver as a legitimate expression of Masonic thought and the understanding of, Mas of Masonic legend at the time, you know, it, back in the 1820s. Yeah. We're not talking about, you know, the 1990s or the 2000s. We're talking right. about this early point of understanding that Joseph was working from in a time when many who came into the Latter-day Saint tradition took these histories as literal rather than legendary. Yeah. And George Oliver wasn't the only one besides right. Joseph Smith who was making the, right. the literalness of the legends. I can't remember yeah. the names of a few others. Salem but, Town, for example. Yes, yes, yes. That's Salem the other one. Town being the one who said the day would come when pure Christianity and pure masonry would both be re, uh, restored and that they would be joined hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. So um, that would seem to be a big point with, um, with Dan. And I, I wish that he could just kind of open up a little bit more to the, to the idea that the book of Mormon might not be purely anti-Masonic, but that Joseph Smith might have had a, more of a, a nuanced view of masonry early on. And that is um, definitely one of the big key points in our book mm -hmm. is that early on, Joseph Smith had um, a fascination with masonry and was yeah, not that, really against it. That was one of the key points in your book that made me basically, I didn't do this really, but made me call in sick and say, I, I can't make it in. And <laughs> I could not put your lovely book down. I just, yeah. I read all the way through it and I said, score these three. <laughs> so and, just, you know, that, that was very interesting to me how you brought all that out. So. It's very gratifying to have um, different people write to us or talk to us and say that the this book has opened their eyes to, you know, the, the idea that, um, that masonry was so prevalent in the day and that Joseph Smith had experience with it and that Joseph Smith might have, you know, um, fashioned his religion uh, with masonry in mind, as well as other things. Mm -hmm. And that's another point is that um, uh, um, Dan and also we're going to get to Jeff Bradshaw a little bit later, um, mm -hmm. all seem to feel that because we are talking about Mormonism and masonry, that we somehow don't feel that Joseph was influenced by Christianity or the Bible or or um, other like Jacksonian America or anything else. And that's not true at all. We very much believe he was influenced by all these things. What, one yeah. of the main things that I have learned in the wake of our book finally coming out is that people do not read prefaces. Because those who have criticized the book uh, with with what Cheryl talks about that somehow we are saying that Mormon, that Freemasonry explains everything about Mormonism clearly did not read or pay attention to the preface because yeah. we're very explicit in the preface. Yes, you are. Yeah. That we're talking about one influence among many. Yeah. And by the way, our, our mutual beloved friend Clinton Bartholomew is here. So hi Clinton. Glad to see you. So yeah, yeah, that's a good point that, uh, the book just caught, of course, and I've known for decades that it was going to come out, you know, and I knew the quality of, of the work you guys do, getting to know you through the years online. I mean, I love the internet, if for nothing else, to have met you three. But yeah, the book just kept me going. I was just, every page for me personally shows how ignorant I am, but every page was a revelation. I, I love that about your books. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> You're okay. going That'll be a thirty-nine dollars and forty-three cents inflation. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, I, I'm really excited that people are getting something out of this. So, um, is there anything else, um, Nick, that you want to say about um, spurious masonry um, 
or meta narrative or no, not at this point. I think I think that's you know for the time we have that's a good okay. you know discussion to that. I, I'm not going to spend you know a full two hours on right, right, right. one yeah. point uh, that shows up in a few pages. So okay. sure. So another thing that um, many people say is that um, Joseph Smith's motivation for joining the lodge was to gain personal capital or provide protection um, in some way. I have here, some have attempted to explain Joseph's involvement in masonry as a 19th century equivalent of social and political networking. So we don't see this at all. Um, but so many people have said this. Um, and in the book, I think we explain quite um, well why we don't believe this. Um, one, they promise when when uh, Mason joined the lodge, they promise that they will not do this, you know, that they will not use it for personal gain. Um, but we know that some people do. So um, so he could have he could have done that. But when we look at we drill down and we look at exactly what Joseph Smith does in Illinois, in Nauvoo, he does not curry favor. He does not. In fact, he does many things to alienate other people right from the beginning. And if he wanted to be politically, if he wanted to curry favor, he would not be behaving the way he did. And the lodge would not have done the things they did um, in order to, to gain. Uh, he, was still, he was still excommunicating fellow Mormons if they got in trouble and all. He never did stop doing that. And then he kept bringing in others. And if they wouldn't, do what he the way he thought things should be going so that that to me that's a pretty good point that's interesting yeah. one, one thing for me when you know dan's response to this point um was instructive to me about wording because you know i i wrote that <laughs> particular passage and right. for me bringing up this this idea that it was actually defamatory to Joseph to say that he joined the lodge for political and social capital. Uh -huh. That was aimed specifically at Mormon apologists who have tried to distance Joseph from Freemasonry oh. saying, no, he wasn't buying into it. He just wanted to curry favor. I was, I, what I was saying is the apologists when they use that argument are ironically actually at the, in the same breath, calling him a liar interesting yeah so yeah. you know so so i understand you know dan's uh, strength of feeling about that and right. like i said it's instructive to me to be a little more careful in in the phraseology uh, because well, well, thank you. yeah thank you for that because see this is why i love having everybody on this show with you with your viewpoints i would have never recognized that point at all so thank you for bringing that up i think that's interesting that's that's clarifying so very so good we, we are really hoping that people who read this book um that this will kind of fall out of vogue now to say that joseph was um using the lodge for political reasons i hope that no one will ever say that again because i, I feel like we make our case really well in the book for that my my impression and you're welcome to correct me if i'm wrong because i probably could be or am most of the time but Joseph, the Freemasonry to Joseph Smith was far more uh, spiritually involving yeah. rather than, uh, say, a political maneuver. I mean, he took, and, and I'm not saying this in a negative fashion, and you can correct my language if I'm doing this wrong, but he took the cream of Masonry and turned it into the butter of Mormonism. I mean, damn, is that good or what? That was wrong. That's <laughs> like a turning idea there. Yeah. He took the best of it and he utilized it in an honorable way. I felt I didn't, I didn't feel threatened by this. Whereas I understand there's a lot of apologists who are. Yeah, and like Cheryl, so Joseph absolutely, uh, you know, did things to alienate the establishment. Jonathan Nye for example, who had been the Grandmaster of Vermont during the time the Smiths were in Vermont, came out to Illinois and Missouri and Iowa to assist Grand Lodges there in the formation of Grand Lodges. 
And he was the one who ended up being assigned to do the initial investigations of Nauvoo Lodge irregularities. And he, he saved their tale initially. He said, well, there's some problems, but there's nothing we can't handle without some good instruction. Hmm. Well, later on, you know, Joseph completely uh, alienates Jonathan Nye, who's an extremely influential person to the point of being made honorary members of many Grand Lodges. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and, and when Jonathan Nye dies and it's reported to Joseph, Joseph basically says, great, that's wonderful news, and goes on to accuse Jonathan Nye of adultery and trying to start an opposition lodge huh. and, and says, this is what happens when you go against the buckler of Jehovah's belt, uh, which was a code phrase uh, uh -huh. at the time for the Danites. So yeah, Joseph definitely was not uh, you know, focused on that. That doesn't yeah. mean that people are not complex and, sure. and, that they don't have multi, and that they don't have many motives. But to try to reduce his motivations uh, to this idea of developing political and social currency is, is really not borne out by the evidence. Yeah. So when I took notes, I, um, I wrote that um, uh, Dan had said the easiest to demonstrate is for protection. Um, and he went into the Guide to Historical Method by Robert Jones Schaefer. But um, I think the reason, and he also said that um, to Dan, it is obvious that Masons would provide protection. But this is because he's not looking at the sources that we looked at. You know, um, Dan has studied uh, Masonry and Mormonism, but not deeply as we have. And so I'm hoping that he will look at more deeply at the sources that we provide that show um, exactly what Joseph Smith was doing. He, now, Dan did not go into the later part of the book. I think he only went through like chapter three um, in your podcasts. And the later part of the book is where you get um, this, these, um, when you drill down into exactly what was happening in Nauvoo. So, and, and what's about Slabby? He'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm sure he's, he's always already read the book, but um, sure. but yeah, uh, these these things show that there was much more that went into it than just providing political protection. And of course, Dan is right that we can't always know that these um, historical figures' motivations. We can't, but when we write about them, we need to make some reasoned conclusions, and that's what we're doing here. And, and what Cheryl's saying here is illustrative of. of you know, a point we made before. This is the first time that experienced Freemasons and experienced Mormons have produced a work on the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, the difficulty has always been either Masons who didn't understand Mormonism or Mormons who didn't understand Freemasonry beyond reading some exposés trying to claim expertise. Right, and several times Dan said, um, no one's ever said that before. And I thought, well, yeah, no one has ever said that before. It's true. And there's a reason why it's being said now. Yeah. And it's all, there's also a reason why this book took so long to come out, you know? Yeah, it's well, I remember talking to Joe and you, Nick. Uh, well, and you, Cheryl. I remember talking to you through the years, you know, kind of inquiring about it and all that and uh, seeing some of the message boards and discussions you guys were on and, uh you you just kept saying just we're we are working on it it's happening <laughs> yeah. stay calm we have a lot of reading well now that i look through your bibliography wow yeah you guys did a boatload of reading no wonder it took three of you no offense to you nick because you started it i know you're capable of producing quality books that's true but this book is better because the three of you pooled your sources. There's no yes. question. Absolutely. Absolutely yes. so I'm very grateful you guys bumped it together and said, okay, let's do this. You know, we can, that was wonderful. Amazing how it all came together. It so um, let's go to the next part. Um, you bet, you bet. So Dan talks a little bit about the lost word. And he said that um, he couldn't find anywhere in the book where we tell what the lost word was. <laughs> and it would, you know, the lost word is very ephemeral. 
but we don't have to prove that Joseph, what the lost word was. We just have to prove that Joseph felt like he had it and that his followers felt like they had, that he had restored the lost word. And right. um, we don't necessarily know what that lost word was, you know, um, but this is this fabulous quote that Nick found um, talking about um, the in the upper room of Joseph's red brick store. Joseph arrived and gave the proper entrance signal to Aishel Perry, who was acting as Tyler at the door. Let him enter, responded George A. Smith, who had taken the place of worshipful master that day. Brother Joseph burst into the room, strode up and down the lodge, and according to the report of Dimmick B. Huntington, exclaimed, Hallelujah, 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 said he. I have done what King Solomon, King Hiram, and, and Hiram Babif could not do. I have set up the kingdom no more to be thrown down forever, nor never to be given to another people. And Dan says that this was not a discovery of the lost word, that this was Joseph was saying, I have set up the kingdom. But if you know what it was that King Hiram, King Solomon, King Hiram, and Hiram of Bip could not do was put that word together. And that was the whole, that's the whole thing about it. And that's what you understand as a, as a Mason. Um, so here, right. that, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, as we've explained, there was in Masonic legend, a covenant between these three that the the lost that the the master's word could only be given if all three were present. Were present, yeah. And with right. the murder of Hiram Abiff, the fulfillment of that covenant became impossible. Yep. And that's yep. what Joseph is referring to. And this gives us shivers, you know. <laughs> just, yeah, what I found, it, I mean, my reaction to finding this account from Dimmick Huntington, you can imagine, was off the chart. <laughs> yeah. This is an amazing quote. And um, it, it gives us so much insight into what Joseph felt that he had done. Now, listen to this, though. This comes later in the book. Such a bold statement, implicitly. Okay, let's go on. Let's see. Okay. On June 15th, 1844, William Clayton wrote in his journal, Joseph Smith con spoke concerning key words. The grand key word was the first word Adam spoke and is a word of supplication. He found the word by the Urim and Thummim. It is that key word to which the heavens is open. So basically, William Clayton now is saying this is what Joseph Smith has done. So Dan is very concerned that we never in the book tell what the lost word was, but we do um, we do show that Joseph believed that he had restored that lost word and his followers believed he had also restored it. So, so there it is, Dan. Yeah. And, and I would add that even if we felt that we had found what the lost word was, um, you know, personally as a Freemason who takes obligations seriously, I would not include that in the book. Because, you know, it, it, within Freemasonry, of course, we're asked to keep a, a substitute word secret. But right. the, the, the injunction is that each individual Mason, and of course it's said, figuratively, but it can be taken beyond, is to personally seek that word out through their own spiritual development. Um, you know, personally, I, although I am no longer a Latter-day Saint, I don't go around divulging the key words of the Latter-day Saint endowment either, because I made an obligation not to do that. So even had we found... Jersky for the home run. <laughs> well, even had we found something that said, oh, here's what Joseph said the word was, uh, you know, personally, I, I, I would have argued against including it, including it. And I think Joe would have too. Uh, I suspect so. And, and, yeah. and Cheryl would have been on board with that, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. because of, because of the covenants and obligations that any of us have entered into. Yep. Yeah. So um, at that point, Dan said something like, oh, well, it's their first book. So <laughs> it's very disturbing. I was very annoyed. <laughs> so, so hopefully this is a response to that. And, you know, I, it is our first book. Mm -hmm. And um, there are mistakes in this book, which we will get to. Um, but this is not this is not one of the mistakes. So um, this was very um I, I yeah. think this is a, a groundbreaking um, part of the book. So, 
and, and Dan, what you said here, that's what I was wondering, but you could say you're at holding it for obvious reasons. Yes, I, I think that would be fair. If we had found what specific word Joseph believed the lost word to be, then you're right. We, we could have then said, hey, we found it, but we're not going to say it. That'd be a little weird uh, as a historical <laughs> writing. Uh, but, you know, that certainly would have been an option. The fact is, we certainly did not find any record of what Joseph said the lost word was. So it will leave that to future researchers. And we have no doubt that people will go on in the future to find things that we missed. Um, sure. Well, I mean, I've, I've heard from other fellow Masons, as well as myself, we're already looking into a lot of stuff. Your book is going to spur an entire industry. And you guys are the ones that broke the strongest, most all-inclusive ground of any author up to date so far. Now, I say that as a compliment. You can't possibly be the last word. Right, right. Wow. And we hope that we what hope it does spur more. Inclusive word. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's how scholarship works. And and right. yes, yes, we hope that we got it right. But the but the reality was Don, Dan picked out a few little things here and there that he pointed out that we didn't quite get right. More power to him. Others are going to find new evidence. Yeah. That shows we completely misunderstood things or missed things. Others are going to find evidence they got things right. They're going to back us up further. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's the nature of scholarship. That's the that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff, you guys. Really good stuff. Okay, okay. so let's go to the next point. Okay. So um Dan does not feel that treasure digging magic, um, any of these things were associated with Freemasonry. Um, we do include many of these things in our book because we feel they have a connection with 19th century Masonry, which is different, than, of course, than uh, contemporary Masonry. Um, did, did you want to say something about that, Nick? Oh, I do. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> I love the reaction. <laughs> Dr. Litursky, he's going to be let loose. This is his thing. <laughs> so, again, going back to George Oliver, and I, and I just recently acquired the first uh, edition of his work. Oh, I'm <laughs> jealous. Yes, I, I, it's one of my little treasures now. Yes. Uh, but George Oliver, for example, in this context of Freemasonry, talks about Adam, legends of Adam taking a branch from the tree of life and being allowed to take that branch and take it with him out of the garden. Allegedly, and according to George Oliver, in this Masonic history, mind you, this eventually ends up with the, that branch, the length of a staff, Resting in the courtyard of the of Jethro, the the uh, a Midian, and Moses just happens to see it, thinks, "Oh, that's an interesting looking stick," and picks it up. And Jethro is amazed and appalled in this very Arthurian uh, kind of take, uh, because nobody's ever been able to move this. And nobody would be able to because this is the staff of Adam taken from the Garden of Eden. Oh, interesting. And this becomes the staff with which Moses leads the children of Israel. The same that is cast down by Aaron. In, with the snakes. With, the, with serpents and such. Yeah, interesting. Now, so I, have, I have a lot to say about the how that story goes further, and that'll be for another work. But okay. early on you have George Oliver getting into these magical practices. And, and in fact, you know, I, I know Dan criticized our suggestion that the wood scrape had Masonic connections. But again, it is these gifts of working with the rod. Staff, the rod, the wand. These are synonymous terms in, in, in the these centuries that we're talking about. Yep. And so all of these things come together one of the one of the challenges that people have had with the book is they want to look at individual pieces 
of evidence and say, oh, I'm not fully convinced that that one individual piece is Masonic. Or, you know, it, it's a connection between Freemasonry and Mormonism. And you're right. If you take that one individual piece, it's not. It's when you put all the pieces together that we have gathered. Mm. And this is, this is like any court case. Circumstantial evidence is evidence. And it's when you have the collection of that circumstantial evidence that you begin to paint a picture from which conclusions can be drawn. So yeah. to say that so, to say yeah. that treasure digging and and magic had no connection with Freemasonry, honestly, is is simply not an accurate reflection of 19th century and earlier Freemasonry or magic. So about the um, the Rodsman, um, he says, Dan says, that's a stretch for me. None of the sources mention masonry. and But we have. Uh, they believed there were descendants of the ancient Jews. They believed in divining rods. They spoke about temples, digging for gold treasure, Masonic millennialism, St. John, restoration, all of these things. So many things um, have Masonic connections. Um, so he doesn't see the Masonic connections, but um, hopefully others will read these in the book and see see that Masonic connection that we've made between magic. And I wonder if we should go to, well, later on we'll go to, to the faculty of BRAC too. Let's go to the next slide. What do I have next? Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. this one. Oh. Yes. Okay. So Dan also says, well, Masons don't use the faculty of BRAC. I'm not going to explain that. Lucy Smith uses that um, uses that phrase in a quote, and Dan says that we're reading too much into it because Masons didn't use the faculty of a brack. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hold 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 it. Let me let me get this off. So there we go. There we go. That's better. George Oliver includes this in his Antiquities of Masonry. Specifically saying it is about pagan, uh, you know, pagan mysteries, right. but oddly enough is making a point of including it in a Masonic work. And of course, we also quote other authors who comment on the nature of that amulet or that charm. You know, the, the yeah. fact is that it, it is, it's all part of it. You know, I was, was going to say too, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't get to this when we were talking about magic, but mm -hmm. also in George Oliver. He uses this symbol with regard to Freemasonry. Any ceremonial magician can tell you this is a magic circle for the purpose of conjuring spirits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and that's a, is that an Enochian triangle in that circle, Nick, or is that me adding to it? It, it is Enochian in nature, certainly. Not, not Enochian magic, which is another... Right, yeah, right. I'm with you. <laughs> no, good clarification, yeah. So the next slide, I think, talks about Enoch and, um, and um, yes. So oh, yeah. Dan also says that the gold plate of Enoch, he does not see any correspondence between the gold plate of Enoch and the Book of Mormon. Um, and he says, can't anybody go digging in a hill without them? <laughs> feeling like it's it's masonic you know um or something like that it was funny but um but but like there's so many correspondences between the gold plate of enoch and and mormonism um so we have enoch's brass pillar has a metal ball on top the book of mormon had tells of a brass ball the liahona enoch foresees a world destroying flood joseph smith receives a revelation of the book of moses giving an account of enoch foreseeing a world destroying flood Enoch predicts, I'm not going to go over all these. There's like 50 of them. There's 50 correspondences between the gold plate of Enoch, between Enoch and Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. So, that, I mean, there's so there's many obvious correspondences. There. In fact, we didn't even really go into all of them in the book because it seemed to us to be so obvious and to other authors um, who have written about that as well. So I, I can't understand why why Dan doesn't see any correspondence between parallelomania. <laughs> so on one hand, he's going to say there's no correspondence. And on the other hand, he's going to say parallelomania. Okay. Um, I, you know, Dan, I think, you know, it's great that you bring that up because honestly, that was a 
concern of ours throughout the writing of the book, because certainly, as, especially on the apologist end, uh, this idea of parallels proving something in and of themselves um, has been abused very heavily. Um, you know, a, a certain CES uh, staff member who wrote a review of our book uh, is, is sort of known for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we really felt that we were cautious in, mm -hmm. in the drawing of these parallels. Yeah. And again, it's a it's a matter of large amounts of circumstantial evidence coming together, not isolated picking and choosing. Right. So another I, thing I, I see Dan doing is, and others do this as well, um, they say, oh, and when we get into the first vision, this will um, be important. Well, maybe I'll wait. Let's go to the next slide. Is it the first vision? Sure. Yeah, we can, we can do that. No. Okay, I'll talk about it later in first vision. Um, Dan, go ahead and go to the, to the next slide. You want to be there? Okay. The Smith family. Because Dan spent a lot of time talking about the Smith family and masonry. And it seems to me that he wanted to minimize um, the connection of the Smith family with masonry. Um, the parallels are weak, he says. I, is he responding to this with weak and contrived? Okay. So um, there are several things that we brought up, I feel, that maybe are not the strongest arguments. We have Alvin Smith, who possessed a lap desk with Masonic implements inside of it, um, who passed it on to Hiram. And we speculate here, and I admit this is, this is speculation that we say, wonder if those Masonic implements were not um, actual Mason tools, but were Masonic um, implements for the craft, for the craft of Freemasonry. So we just wonder that in the book. And... Um, when Dan spoke about it, he uh, went on and on about this lap desk. Oh, you can't fit the Book of Mormon in the lap desk. And he, he went on into other people's arguments about the lap desk, which had nothing to do with what we were arguing. So he made it sound like we, in the podcast, he made it sound like we were saying things that we weren't. So um, there are times when we do speculate. We wonder if this might have been something or other. And um, I think that we're not trying to make any point. We just are, are wondering about possibilities. We wonder if Alvin Smith was a Mason. That's all. So go to the next slide. So Hiram Smith was definitely a Mason. Um, and... Uh, Dan talks about the spelling of Hiram's name. Um, it, this is a big point for, uh, for Dan. We did not make a big issue out of this. My personal belief, I don't know if Nick and Joe really believes, believe this like I do, but I am strongly convinced that in the 19th century, spelling was very fluid and people didn't care how their names were spelled. They really did not. In census records, you will see it spelled differently every 10 years. You know, and I feel like Hiram didn't care how his name was spelled. Dan thinks that he changed his the writing of his signature from H I R A M to H Y R U M after the Morgan affair, and that that was meaningful. So here we have um, signatures of Hiram after 1830. I guess after 1830, where he spells it H. Why are you in? But if you look on the left there, that little book is Hiram Smith's book. Up on the top, that's where he signed it. And then later on, later on, another person um, took possession of that book and then wrote that this was the book of Hiram, H-I-R-A-M Smith. Now he writes it right underneath where it says Hiram H-Y, you know, and so he, he can read. You know, I feel like, honestly, it didn't make a difference to him what the spelling was. And, and, and when, we when we talk about, you know, this huge influx of people in Vermont naming their, their sons Hiram around the time of the, the creation of the Grand Lodge of Vermont, those spellings were all over the map as well. They, oh. they, were, they were basically every phonetic version of Hiram that you could come up with. And that did not mean that they were different names. That did not mean that somebody spelled, 
their child's name with a different vowel in order to distance it from Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was just a variety of spellings. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what it does show is it, go ahead to the next one. Um, Cause I think here's the testimony, of the eight witnesses to the Book of Mormon and you see Hiram Smith with the H Y. Um, so, but I think that what it does show is that there was an interest um, on Joseph Smith Sr.'s part in Masonry as early as the birth of Hiram Smith for him to be um, naming his son Hiram. And that, that argument is um, one of Nick's and it's very good. It's in the book talking about the, um, the beginnings of, um, of the use of that, word, that name Hiram uh, when the lodge entered the area in Vermont. So, okay, go to the next one. So, um, Oh, okay. here's the important signature of Hiram, isn't it? Well, this isn't a signature, but this is the lodge minutes, um, in Nauvoo. So now, um, Dan talked quite at length about, we don't really know if Hiram was the Hiram that was in Mount Moriah Lodge. Yeah. Well, it's pretty certain that Hiram was, that was the, the Hiram, because he later in Nauvoo Lodge declares his membership. And here's the minutes, the following members then reported themselves to Hale from the lodges appended to their names, respectively, to wit, George Miller, Widow's Son, Wilson. Lodge, and then Hiram Smith, Mount Moriah, number 112, New York. So he declares that he, that he, that was the lodge he was in. Now Dan says he offered it up as possible evidence of a change of attitude. So Dan said in your podcast that um, he felt that maybe Hiram did join the Mount Moriah Lodge and then he later left Freemasonry and then in Nauvoo he came back. Now there's no evidence for this. And, and Dan, you know, Dan in the podcast basically tried to say that we could not reliably say that Hiram Smith was the Hiram in, in Mount Moriah Lodge. And what, you know, given what we have in the Nauvoo Lodge records, that would involve a conspiracy in which Hiram Smith somehow knew that there had been a Hiram Smith in Mount Moriah Lodge at some point it would be to show up on the records and now is when to lie and say well i'm that hiram i can't quite imagine what the point of that would be uh, especially when you look at the fact that hiram right away was taking on important ritual roles in the lodge which showed the fact that he was an experienced freemason yeah, yeah. we're pretty sure about hiram's uh, membership in the lodge now joseph smith senior if you go to the next slide we are not sure if Joseph Smith Sr. was a Freemason before his death. And we talk about this in the book um, and we explore different things. We explore whether Joseph Smith um, Sr. was the person in Vermont who petitioned a lodge in Vermont and was, um, was turned down. Um, we never say that that was Joseph Smith Sr., our Mormon Joseph Smith Sr., we just explore, you know, different ideas. And we also explore whether he was um, the Joseph Smith that joined Canandaigua Lodge. And um, so let's see. here's just a paragraph from the book talking about the wording that we use, um, talking about could have, he could have become a Mason in Vermont. So go to the next one. Um, so we say a search of Mount. Okay, this was what Dan took issue with, this particular sentence. A search of Mount Moriah's lodge records has not revealed the induction of a Joseph Smith, but he does appear on the records of Ontario Lodge number 23. So um, Dan's saying that this wording is, we are definitely saying that this Joseph Smith is our Joseph Smith Sr. Because I say, he does appear, but really this is, I'm, I'm still speaking of a Joseph Smith here. I am not coming down and saying this is our Joseph Smith. So if, if, later, you, pressed, if you pressed me, I would still say, I think it was, but I, I don't think it's at an absolute proven, nor do I think that as Dan just said, that there's no evidence. No evidence. Right. 
So Dan says that he could have been, but there's no evidence of it. So what we're exploring in the book is we are not saying outright that he was a, a Freemason, but we are exploring what evidence could there be that um, shows that Joseph Smith Sr. could have been a Mason. And you can decide for yourself. Now, all of us three authors believe that uh, Joseph Smith Sr. was a Mason in Canandaigua. Um, but we tell you right in our book, in the pages of our book, why we believe that, and you can make up your own mind. So, sure. so if Dan doesn't want to agree. Um, that's yeah, that's fine, and and that's okay. <laughs> so, but but what I worried about was that he that he said that we definitely say in the book, and now I've heard other people say this too, that um, we as authors um, show that Joseph Smith Senior was a Mason, but we don't do that. We just bring up the possibility. So okay, fair enough. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a very good possibility. Okay, so go to the next one. There he is. <laughs> there now he is. everybody in chat knows what Dan Vogel looks like. There he is. We've. I never guess seen on my him. Facebook page, I I talked about you using that that sexy pose of me, and somebody <laughs> said that Dan should. Dan should see if he could could rebut with a sexy pose of his own. So here he is. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can compare. <laughs> and good return. <laughs> Dan, he, he does look pretty good there. Um, he does. He looks and good. And this is also an early picture of him, like that other one was an early picture of me too. Dan has argued that this Joseph Smith was unlikely to be the father of the Mormon prophet. He points out, and this is actually this, um, is from our book. We have this in our book. This is a quote from our book. Dan Vogel has argued that this Joseph Smith was unlikely to be the father of the Mormon prophet. He points out that the Ontario Lodge record lists the initiative and we tell the reasons why. So we, we I think, give, um, give fair airplay to the other side of the issue. Dan says the first sentence is too strong. Okay, can never win, but um, but we do we do show both sides of the argument, and we do and we show J Dan's side of the of the issue. So, well, hey, actually, my impression here, really seriously, is we are all looking for the same thing, and more or less all on the same side, trying to figure mm -hmm. out yeah. just what is going on. Yeah. And again, I, I am looking very forward. If he will come on, uh, I'm friends with Jeff Bradshaw and I have broached the subject. I invited him to watch this meeting tonight, this okay. show, and hopefully I can get him to come on <clears throat> because I personally would really enjoy his approach to all of this yeah and so this we'll get to it we're gonna get to we're gonna get to Jeff but but um we do want to thank Dan we for all of his historical research we quote him quite frequently we use his his um books a, a lot in in writing our book we used his uh historical documents mm -hmm. series and he's done great great work Absolutely. so let's go on let's go on um so this is where, and the, I didn't mean to blot these out. I meant to highlight them. <laughs> so, oops. Um, so, but this is a point that Dan has brought up that was a, was a typo in our book, where it says Joseph Smith, the first one is our Joseph Smith Sr., location Farmington, distance from Ontario Lodge, we said eight miles, and Mount Murad, Murad Lodge, we said it was, Number, where was that? Um, 123. Now, it, that is a typo. It was lodge number 112. And we do have that elsewhere in the book when we talk about Mount Moriah Lodge, we, we have 112. But here, we for some reason, it was a typo 123. Uh, so thank you. We get to correct that in the paperback. Yeah. <laughs> we will correct go, that. Right? Yes. Um, so thank you. And also he talks about the eight miles and I think he makes great points when he talks about the eight miles. Um, we did take the eight miles from Farmington. Um, what was that? Um, is it village? Farmington village um, instead of the township 
or the other way around. Um, and so Dan showed that it was um, a few miles more. I think he said 13 miles rather than eight. And his point is very well taken there. So, yes. Um, very good. Bravo. I love yeah. it when scholars can agree and disagree <laughs> and do it amiably. So, this is yeah. Rocking. Yeah. I still feel like we make good points there. But Joseph Smith was not the closest um, Joseph Smith to the um, Ken and Daigua Lodge. So. Okay, from Ontario Lodge. Okay, let's go on. Did William Morgan know Joseph Smith? Ooh. So, um, <laughs> here's another point we just are wondering, and we have some good evidence that shows um, that perhaps they did. Um, there's a quote that says, um, John Whitney reported in later years that Morgan had been a halfway convert of Joe Smith the Mormon, um, and then we have um, from the Masonic Intelligencer, in the spring of 1826, Morgan was absent and the general impression among his acquaintance was that he had absconded, at least he had gone to parts unknown. During Morgan's absence, his wife had her second child and claimed assistance, blah, blah, blah. Um, during this period, it since appears that Morgan was in Ontario County writing his book. So he was placed so that he could have known Joseph Smith. And there was at least one quotation that says that he was a halfway convert of Joe Smith. Now, Dan says that this is the only place anyone's ever said this. So he doesn't. Well, we know he knew Morgan's widow. Yes. Well, later. <laughs> just saying. <right. laughs> later. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's just very interesting. And we do in our book bring out things that are very interesting to us, you know? It might be interesting to know that they may have had a contact with each other. It may be interesting to why did he later have a close relationship with um, Lucinda, you know, those kind of things. So, okay, let's go on. Okay. The next one. Okay. Oh, that's a beautiful slide. I love that. <laughs> I really do. I love that. That's awesome. Thank you. You've got you've got so, good taste in slides. Here. Our our parallelomania, which Dan objects to, he does not find this compelling that the first vision accounts mirror the Masonic rite of illumination. He does oh, not true. feel that there are. He said there aren't. I think he said that the similarities are not compelling to him. Um, now he goes through several of these and talks about how they're weak. And um, the thing about this is, and this happens other places in the book as well, is you might pick out one of these similarities and show how it could be weak. And I have an example of, um, you know, say I, I tell you my name is Chelsea. Well, there's many, many people whose names are Chelsea in this country. And then I tell you that um, my mother's name is Hillary and my father's name is Bill. Well, we could find many people who have those parents' names. And then, oh, my parents were lawyers. And, oh, I lived in Washington, D.C. for a time. And I go on and on and on. And I tell you many little things. Now, I never have to come out and tell you my father was the president of the United States for you to know that I'm Chelsea Clinton. Um if I tell you 20 different things about myself that perhaps you can pick out one or two and say, oh, that's, that's weak, you know? But when you put them all together, this makes a very strong case. And when you put the First Vision accounts, um, all their Masonic similarities together, you can see that there's a very strong case that Masonry influenced the story of the First Vision. Um, and, and maybe it, it, it looks later. Story, it can also mean the telling of the story, how right. the story is framed, how it is worded. This becomes very prominent in the Golden Plates, for example, where the descriptions are obviously influenced by Freemasonry. He's still not convinced, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> so contrived, he says. Okay, so, I mean, this may also have been told later, like you said, Nick. Um, it may be a later telling of a remembered um, experience. But um, when you have so many that um, fit together like this, 
then that is very strong evidence. And this happens keep it on the slide, or do you want? Yeah, keep it on the slide. Oh, for Pete's sake. <laughs> It was the prettiest slide, too. Okay, here we go. Okay. Then. So, I mean, the fact that the scripture he used, um, um, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask, seek, and knock. This is an important scripture to Freemasonry. Well, yeah. I mean, that might be weak because it's also been found in the Bible. And, you know, so that might be weak on its own. On its own. But if you take all the rest of the things that we go through in the chapter, I think it'll convince you. So maybe not. Hey, an, idea, an idea just popped into my head. I'll share it with you real quick. It's perhaps as an analogy, uh, you have one little string and by itself it's weak. Right. You take two strings and twist them, it's okay. You take 32 strings and twist them, you've got a rope that'll pull a ship. <laughs> And by the way, none of this discounts the fact that there were multiple accounts at that time of visions of God and Jesus mm -hmm. or you know, any of these other cultural things. Again, nowhere are we saying these that only Masonry influences yes. these things. We are saying that Freemasonry was an influence. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's an important point. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause Jeff Bradshaw does that too. Mm -hmm. um, Dan yeah. says, well, why didn't you use so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so wrote about this and why didn't you? <clears throat> and Jeff said the same thing. Why didn't you use this apologist, that apologist who also wrote about, you know, because this is, those aren't the, um, that's not what we were focused on. We're focused on masonry and Mormonism. We're not focused on Christianity and, and Mormonism, you know, so. Or, or ancient Near Eastern ritual and Mormonism. Yeah, or, that's uh, hey, that's hey, book. that's where Jeff Bradshaw is going to come into play then. And we want to save some time to talk about Jeff. And we are closing on it. Let me put this back up and you can. Okay, so keep going then. <laughs> oh, did you get through all this that you yes, want? Yes, they okay. can read that. Yeah. Okay, let's go to this next one. Okay, let's just skip over that one. Go to the next one. Okay. Oh, that's the last one. Right. You want to go back so, to that last one? No, 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 no. Okay. Just so okay. dances, we're reading too much into things. And that's where my Chelsea Clinton thing comes in. I, I feel like if we looked at one, if you just look at one thing that we're doing, you may think that we're reading too much into it. But when we, when we, you know, have so many different things that are based on masonry, then it really makes a big difference. And that's what's so. Um, illuminating about the book is that you see all these different things yeah. put together in one place. And this, of course, is the, is Dan's pervasive complaint. And and even in the comments that are showing at the bottom this evening, you know, he's saying contrived or you know reaching too hard. What's it, what's really interesting is he's saying that about everything in the book. Now, I'll admit, I eventually gave up watching the diatribes, but. Mm -hmm. You know, what I noticed that the first four hours ranted about the first 33 pages of the book and only one semi-positive note was made that something he found interesting that we had discovered. Honestly, if you can if you can go on for eight hours about a book and find nothing positive about it, then your reaction may not be really about the book. And, and you know, that comes in, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting because, you know, Dan mentioned that he'd read a couple books by Jung decades ago, and that apparently made him an expert on Jung. But what apparently he doesn't know about Jung is, the, is Jung's discovery of psychological complexes and the kind of overwrought reactions that we can sometimes have originate from those psychological complexes and sometimes can completely take us over in, in terms of our behavior. The reaction that Dan has had, where he cannot seem to find anything positive, is not a scholarly reaction. It is a react, and it's an emotional reaction. Well, unless the book really sucks, <laughs> right? But you know, it, and, 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 if, and if Dan wants to clarify, 
that he genuinely, from a scholarly standpoint, believes that there is nothing useful in this book, then, you know, perhaps he should consider that, you know, there's more going on for him than just a scholarly reaction here. Oh, here's a good question. Can we answer this? And then we'll jump on to Jeff Bradshaw. Okay. What does Method Infinite mean? Why did you call wow. your book Method Infinite? That's a great question. It is. Eliza R. Snow uh, was quoted later in later years saying there is method in Mormonism. Method Infinite. Mormonism is Masonic. And we yeah. found that just a juicy, wonderful quote. And, and <laughs> you need for a, a you can't leave cover. that one out. No right. kidding, man. Yeah. Put it right on the cover. Yeah. 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 So that, that's what it, that's where that comes from. Okay. So early on on the show, on the start, we had this fine gentleman. And I'm not doing this to mock Jeff. Uh, it's just, it's a fun meme that went on the message boards. And we were kind of laughing about how he's uh, just conveniently coming up with his own book at about the same time you guys he was trying to get a book out at the same time and now he's done some reviews and uh so he does have a new review on interpreter uh that is dan peterson's uh scholarly work online scholarly work basically peterson can't stand being away from farms so interpreter my impression of it is it's Farms Jr. And I don't mean that disparagingly either. He just doesn't have the infrastructure now that he used to as the Farms editor. But so there's a controversy here and I want to be crystal clear. I'm of the, I'm of the impression that Jeff Bradshaw has asked, uh, and, and you guys are friends. I mean, you're all basically working together more or less. And, and he knew about your book coming out and you knew about him wanting to, uh, to study Freemasonry as an apologist, did he actually ask both of you for uh, a copy of the book so that he could write a review and write his own book to respond to your book? So the reality is a few months before the book came out, he contacted Lloyd Erickson, the managing editor of Colford Books. Oh and yeah. Asked, yeah Lloyd. And asked for a, an advanced reader's copy before we even had the ARCs printed so that he could have a review ready to issue at the time the book was published. Oh, okay. I actually objected at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you hard nose. <laughs> because, because I'm familiar with, with Dan Peterson and his brand of apologetics. And I was not interested in right. the kind of ad hominem attacks that are typical there. Right. Jeff assured Lloyd that he would not go into the ad hominem. And, and even said that he would write the review himself to make sure that that didn't happen. So over our objections, or I should say at least my objections, I shouldn't speak for Cheryl there. Um, Lloyd gave him a, P, a full PDF of the book before we even had actual printed ARCs. The entire representation at the time was so that he could have a review written to come out at the same time as the book. Okay. So in no way were we informed at that stage that he was preparing a book of his own. Oh. No, not whatsoever. I think the light bulb went on. Right. So he, uh, we feel that he obtained the advanced reading copy um, under false pretenses. Because yeah, what yeah. happened was later on, about May, then he let us know, oh, I'm going to take, um, and he had written a long article in The Interpreter in, I believe, was it 2018? Um, about 15? Mm -hmm. um, about uh, ancient correspondences um, in, uh, and masonry in the book, and Freemasonry and Mormonism. And so he said, oh, now I've decided that I'm going to expand this article into a book. Now still, this was May, we still did not realize that he was going to use our mm. book and so um, much, oh. use that book in writing his book. And we did not realize he was going to try to get this book out at the same time that our book was going to come out. Right. He also did not ask us for permission to quote from the book 
because this is an advanced reading copy. We don't want anyone, we, we'd love for people to quote from the book later on when they're responding to it, but we would like for our book to come out first before sure. anyone starts quoting from it. And, and just so you know, this is typical in the publishing industry to actually have an embargo on reviews mm -hmm. until at least the same week as the book is coming out. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what he did was then he cornered me at um, Mormon History Association. We had lunch together and he asked me many questions about masonry, which I was free to answer with him. And he asked about the book. He tried to refine his thinking which he was going to um, put out in his book so that, you know, he wanted to catch any little mistakes that he would get. And I thought that this book, he gave the impression to me that this book was far in the future, that he was going to come out with the review and then he was going to work on a book in the future. And was that your impression too as well, Nick? Yes. So well, he did he correspond with both of us. Impression too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he later began to correspond uh, with us and ask us to look over drafts, mm -hmm. um, allegedly saying, you know, saying that he wanted to be sure he was not misrepresenting our views. Right. And in fact, we helped him avoid some really embarrassing mistakes um, in, in terms of what he was saying about history and such. Yeah. Um, on a few occasions, he did ask if he could quote our, dis you know, from our discussions. And we did, in some cases, give him permission for that. Well, but Nick did. I, I didn't want him quoting me. Okay. Um, but, but Nick did. But he did not ask to quote from the book. And huh. he did end up quoting quite liberally from the yeah. book. Yeah, that was and, then, and then shortly before our release date, um, he unveiled the fact that his book was actually coming out in the same week uh, as a print-on-demand. Um, and... You know, this, this book is not a rapid, uh, Hey, Nick's starting to act like me. Woohoo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, so, so he came out with this book. It is cheaply produced print on demand. Um, you know, lots of pretty pictures. It, it looks really thick, but it's mostly because there's lots of pretty pictures in it uh, for filler. So it looks authoritative and, and big on the shelf. Right. Um, well, but yes, it, it came out in the meantime, the review we kept asking him about, because he also said that he would share the review with us before he issued it again, to make sure he was not misrepresenting our views. So we kept asking, where's the review? Where's the review? Uh -huh. and, and we got everything short of my dog ate my homework. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 And then it even like Clinton Bartholomew also had. Yeah, the that looks. Paper. Yeah, that's sad. You know, and the, and it became quite obvious to us that he was using the advanced review copy to write his book. And then later, when he was pushed on it, he did come out with a quite extensive review. Um, but that was secondary to his main purpose for getting the advanced review copy was to write his own book which is a rebuttal. It is not, um, you know, it is a rebuttal to Method Infinite, which is fine because, you know, that's what we would expect. I'll be interested in reading that. I, I wouldn't even call it a rebuttal. I call it a, I would call it a redirection. Oh, okay. Because he, so, Nick, well, well in, his, in his, the book does not actually refute Method Infinite. In fact, it acknowledges that's the depths of our historical research. But instead right. it says, don't, it says, but look over here instead. Look that way. Oh, and don't tell me. Let me guess. To the ancient world. Exactly. So oh, that, is, do I know that, is, that is the focus. And when his review finally came out, mind you, the review did not come out until all this began to go public. Mm -hmm. Right. And Dan Peterson saw it go public. And on everybody was beginning day, to pile they... on saying something smells funny. Yeah. Finally, we, we got a draft of the review, and the review itself says some very positive things about the book. But then, yeah. like Cheryl said earlier, is, well, sure. gosh, why didn't you agree with these other apologists that I'm citing? <laughs> and then a whole, third of the, a whole third of the review is, again, but look over here. And it's his own, you know, it's promoting his own interest in the ancient world, which is very rehashed nibbly. I mean, it, it's, yeah. 
now. Mm-hmm. That's just what it is. Yeah. Um, well, and, and I mean, he's the grandfather of the the farm's apologetics, and they yeah. just can't seem to leave him alone. Right. So I get that. I, I get that. It's okay. All that, all that said, to, to his credit, he kept his word in, in staying away from ad hominems. Uh-huh. You know, we, we did not get a shoot the messenger, which is typical of of these sort of review sources. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. That's good. And, and you know, and, and we did have cordial exchanges. But in the end, we honestly felt like we had been very deceived. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Doggone it. Yeah. But I mean, it happens. So, well, OK, now here's the good news then. I'm going to try to get him on my show so that we can talk about the contents of his book. I, I have not seen it. I, I partially got through the review that was posted on Thanksgiving Day on the interpreter uh, by Peterson. Um, but um, my <laughs> here's the thing that Joe taught me. Well, you did. All three of you have taught me this. I keep going back to Joe because he's the one I talk to the most on the phone. I'm not trying to slight either one of you, but. <laughs> But but the idea here is that it is senseless. There there is no reason to go two thousand years ago, right? When it's right in Joseph Smith's mm-hmm. own backyard yeah. for his entire life. Yeah. yeah. So even if he does bring up Egyptian parallels like Nibley and Babylonian like Guy, and how about the Mesopotamian? Can we get yeah. over? Who yeah. gives a flip? It's in Joseph Smith's backyard in his own family. Right. And, yeah. and, and ironically, many of the apologists would love to respond to things like the George Oliver references by saying, well, you have no proof he ever read George Oliver. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> we do because, you know, he quoted it. But, yeah. you know, that, that's that's the line. Right. And yet, you know, they, they want to say there's these ancient parallels, um, which... Yeah. somehow are contorted into proof of revelation and, and it's unfortunate. Right. so that's what that's what i was talking when we talked at mha i was trying to dig down and say why why are you interested in the ancient parallels what what meaning does this have for you is and i think are, are you trying to say that joseph could not have known about these things and yet since we see them anciently that um, there's a, a, the same source of revelation to the ancients and then to Joseph Smith. Is that what you're trying to say? And he says, well, I don't want to make it that, you know, he doesn't want to actually come out and say that because later on we could maybe find out that, that no, it came from something more modern. And so I don't want to put his neck in the noose, um, you know, but, but to me, it doesn't, um, that's not, an interest to me it's just not interesting to look back that doesn't prove to me revelation you know that's not um and that's i mean that's the whole emphasis on ancient correspondences is because they want to prove that joseph smith got these things from revelation and not from his surroundings yeah and well and then the other thing that's so interesting to me because i'm coming from a mormon apologist former mormon apologist like you guys uh, is this, is this, I, I'm, I'm going to try to word this fair, but, but real, this skittish, this fear, maybe mm-hmm. this skittishness about acknowledging anything in Joseph Smith's environment. Mm-hmm. And, and so he, they want it in a vacuum, so to speak, mm-hmm. so that he gets it purely from revelation, so that it's totally unique. That right. Yes. And so the, the thing curious too is that um he in his book he he wants to say in his book, I'm not afraid of looking at the Masonic correspondences. He's trying to say that, and yet he can't get there. He is not getting there at all because he wants because when he does say, Well, this may have been affected by masonry, he'll put a huge but 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 in front of it, and you know, yeah. it's just Right. He wants to minimize those those correspondences. Yeah. One right. thing, you know, I mean, look at the title here and you see what's really at the core of this. Oh, there you go. Right. And, and what's, yeah. what's interesting is, you know, to me, you know, granted, I am no longer a believing Latter-day Saint. Right. Certainly. 
But our book deals very little with the temple ordinances and, and certainly does not preclude the idea of inspiration. We talk about we talk about an influence on early Mormonism. Yeah. And, and honestly, to me, the idea of of the the idea that the temple ordinances were taken from Freemasonry is tr almost trivial because it's just one little iceberg tip out of a much bigger story of Masonic influence in early Mormonism. Mm -hmm. So what, what the apologists are doing here through, through Jeff's work is really honing in on the one thing that frightens them because they are afraid and we're afraid from, you know, before they even got the manuscript that we were going to attack the Latter-day Saint temple experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you know it's, everything he's do, everything that's being done here is aimed at that, not at the rest. And I didn't see an attack on the Mormon temple stuff at all mm -hmm. in your yeah. guys's book, yeah. I, and I I knew beforehand that that wasn't what your yeah. focus was going to be anyway. It's not it's not anti Mormon. It's right. pro truth is how I like to put yeah. it now. When people yeah. say, "Well, you're just anti Mormon," said, yeah. "No." And yeah. here, here's what is so remarkable, you guys. Seriously, um, everyone around Joseph Smith though were Freemasons were becoming Freemasons and bragging about how it helped them understand the endowment. That's been lost in today's Mormonism, hasn't yeah. it? And yes, and we really, really, that's what we wanted to bring out. Why? And what was Joseph Smith all about? What was he doing? You know, we, that's what we were trying to dig out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because because there was no, it wasn't a contest. Oh, well, it's either masonry or Joseph Smith's exactly. revelation. It was yeah. masonry that helped give Joseph Smith his revelation. And interestingly, um, the book points out is that even after we have the Nauvoo Temple and we have people going through the Nauvoo Temple um, after Joseph Smith's death and getting their endowments, even after that, they're still becoming Masons. In some cases, oh, we didn't cool. found, they would get their endowment and then become a Mason. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting. And then we look at other um, uh, break off um, sects from Mormonism where they also are finding Freemasonry important. And yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. Toward the end of the book, the back of the book, the break off sects were still doing the Freemasonry and endowments. Yeah, that was that was fun. That I'd never seen that in any other discussions on masonry. So look, the good news is <laughs> you guys have seriously broken some. I'm, I'm not going to say new ground. I'm going to say what you did is you've broken extended ground far, far out, much greater width and in depth. And for that, sincerely, Mormonism and all the rest of us are going to be eternally in your debts for the magnificent work you've done. Now, I understand that the book was, it's essential, and it's a big book. Thank you, because I love big books. That put a lot of, it was actually cut in half by the editor. So there are some future materials coming out from you guys, right, on this subject still. Probably, but um, Nick is actually going to break more new ground. So um, I'm really excited about where he's going with uh, with his directions. So yeah, we, we've talked a little bit about it and we'll yeah, talk some more about it. Yeah. Just remember, just remember, Dr. Letursky, you are earmarked for this show. When you <laughs> <produce more stuff. laughs> no, you guys, I, I have just loved this immensely. Thank you so very much for your time. I know it's precious to you and important and, and thank you for sharing your knowledge and your information and your understanding and your reviews or reviews. I will have Dan Vogel on again in January, which will give you two a chance if you would like to come back on my show. I would love to have you on my show again. So I'm going to, we're going to close it out for now, you guys in the audience. Thank you for being such a great audience. I appreciate all your support and love. And we will, we will be back.
uh, next Sunday, I'm going to have Barry Richens on. And we are going to talk about Book of Mormon and archaeology mm. in both places, Mesoamerica, which he has been to and knows some of the natives and talked to them, and the heartland, whom he also knows people archaeologists and some of the issues with that so don't miss next week and in the meantime remember be good do well have fun stay friends sleep well don't overeat like i do and so on and so forth and we will catch you guys on the next backyard professor live show bye everyone right. thanks gary thank you everybody